This is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptized? They answered, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about twelve of them. The classic definition of a proverb is a condensed, possibly memorable saying, embodying some experience that is taken as true by some people. There was a first grade teacher that collected well-known proverbs, and she gave as part of her teaching on that day each child in her class the first half of a proverb, and asked them then to come up with the remainder of the proverb. It's better to be safe than punch a fifth grader. <laughs> Don't bite the hand that looks dirty. A miss is as good as a mister. If you lie down with dogs, you'll stink in the morning. <laughs> An idle mind is the best way to relax. <laughs> Children should be seen and not spanked or grounded. <laughs> Today is celebrated all over the world as the baptism of Jesus. How many of you remember your baptism? Good. About a third of you. Maybe a little bit more than that. For some, baptism was a child's ritual, a children's ritual. You don't have any remembering of that day. Or you may have come from a tradition that only older children or adults were baptized. You may have been immersed in a pool or immersed in a river or a lake. You may have had water poured over your head or sprinkled. Baptism is for many more like a proverb, a condensed, possibly memorable group of sayings that's taken as true. And contrary to what many will try to tell you, the Bible does not spell out, there is not a systematic theology about the act and sacrament of baptism. Today's gospel from the beginning of Mark is a narrative of the time Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan. And then the epistle that my you read is of a baptism during Paul's travels as the church was beginning to form. The emphasis in both scriptures isn't on how much water was there or what kind of water was there. The emphasis was on what happened after the water. So whether you were dunked or poured or sprayed or sprinkled, and unlike a proverb, baptism is much more than a set of memorable sayings or even a specific physical action. The emphasis from today's scripture is not so much the history of what happened then, but the reminder that a recognizable transformation occurs in your life. At the core of every baptism, from the youngest 
to the oldest is the understanding that what God begins to love us and seeks to become part of our lives, and we recognize that God has been loving us for a long time, even before we recognized it. Whether we were an infant and our parents recognized that love on our behalf and committed to raise us in a Christian home, or we came to the Lord later in life, what's commonly called in our contemporary culture as born again or believer's baptism, John's gospel affirms and tells us that we learn to love God because God loved us first. How many of you remember Pee Wee's Playhouse? All right, it's more people than got, they remember their baptism. That's good. <laughs> Pee Wee's Playhouse. It was a big deal in our family. Our family's kind of quirky in that way. We liked it. Our daughter, Amy, 35 years old, texted me the day that the Playhouse came out as a gift set on Blu-ray. She was so excited that she could finally get all of the Pee Wee's Playhouse on Blu-ray and watch them. And then pass that on to our granddaughter, Hannah, who we already have this kind of second language that we speak that's derivatives from Pee Wee's Playhouse. There's a part of Pee Wee's Playhouse and every one of them that talks about the secret word. And it would be the word that would be introduced every time at the beginning. And then it would be spoken of in conversation or it would be found within the, the time that the Pee Wee's Playhouse was going on for that day. And as soon as the word would happen, bells would go off and stuff would fly around. And it was like a big celebration, right? All this week, I kept thinking about Pee Wee's Playhouse as I was reading the gospel lessons and beginning to study and ponder on today's uh, scripture lessons. Because every time I'd see the word spirit, because it's the emphasis in our past tends to go to the water side of baptism. But immersed in all of our liturgy and especially in the readings today, there's this word spirit. Spirit, spirit that keeps coming up. And I think we just drive right by it. Because we're thinking about the water. Just as the water of baptism brings emerging disciples into God's presence, we're also made aware in Paul's account that the early church had this relationship between baptism and the empowering of the spirit. There was an emerging technology that I was reading about this week uh, that was really interesting to me. It's about the tests that they are developing for measuring your body's health. Well, this technology that's being developed says instead of taking your body's temperature, the doctor is going to take your breath away and analyze that. As you exhale deeply into a device, it will begin to measure every component of your breath and it will reveal the health of your whole body and actually indicate what's going to happen down the road with you. See, our breath is 99% water. But in that 1% that's left is roughly 3,000 other compounds that have been detected including bits of DNA, proteins, bacteria, fats floating in the mist, the stuff that we exhale as air or wind. So this wind is who we are and it's who we will be. According to Luke, who wrote the gospel and the book of Acts of the Apostles, he really is telling us throughout both of those books, the reception of the Holy Spirit was at least as important as water baptism. You know, I grew up as a Baptist, as a preacher's kid. And we have our patron saint. We never called him the patron saint, but his name is John the Baptist, right? The baptizer. And I really believe that built in the ethos 
of the theology of the Baptist tradition is this emphasis of the forgiveness of sins as the baptism piece. I never could make the connection with the spirit part. I understood the forgiveness of sins part. But I knew of others, other traditions, Pentecostals, Charismatics. As I grew up to be a young man, I saw that they really emphasized the spirit. And so I was 33 years old. I was in the record business. I got melanoma on my back. I went to the doctor and he said, it's melanoma, we're going to take it off. And he said, he calls me back and he says, yes, it's melanoma, we've got to, you got to come back in and take, we got to take more out. And so in that window of time, I'm really wondering, am I going to make it to see my children graduate from high school? Have I spent my life wisely? All of those questions you have, right, when you come up against those kind of deals, life-threatening deals. And at that time, right around that time that I was pondering all of this, a songwriter asked me to come hear him sing some songs to see if I would sign him as an artist. And he was singing at this Pentecostal church. Now, Charlotte and I were Baptists. We were involved in the Baptist church. We had been baptized in the Baptist church. We were raising our children in the Baptist church. We were active in the Baptist church. So we go to this Pentecostal church we sit in the back row. About halfway through, I don't know any of those people there except for that songwriter. About halfway through, I turned to Charlotte and I said, if I have to go to the hospital for this cancer, I want you to call these people. They're praying. The spirit is alive in this place. I don't know how it's alive, but I want these people praying for me if they will. We then kind of moved into the, going to that church and I became involved in that church. And it's a charismatic church. It's called Christ Church Nashville. If you Google, it's a large, large church. My good friend Dan Scott is a senior pastor there now. And it's certainly a long way from where we are here as the Episcopal Church. But it was there in that community of faith that I began to recognize that I had a baptism that had given me the forgiveness of my sins but I had never awakened the spirit part of my life. Trying to do all the right things. I was trying to live a godly life. I was trying to raise my family in a godly home. But my spirit, the spirit of my life, the Holy Spirit had just been dormant. I didn't recognize it. It became more alive in this charismatic church that we were a part of now. But it's amazing to me that that is the channel that God used for me and Charlotte to become awakened into our spiritual lives. And then that led me, that church led me to the Episcopal Church, which led me into this tradition of worship. See, we tend to not think about the spirit part of our baptism. I think that's my point I'm trying to make today. We... We kind of emphasized the water piece and that happened and it was done. It was one time sacrament and I had done that as well in my life. And it was only at 33 did I, did I become aware that there was this spiritual part of me that had been dormant for so long. And the Lord was trying to wake me up and to activate that. That when a person received baptism... In the early church, they received the Holy Spirit. And what was principally given to them was the gift of prophecy. Now, when we think of prophecy, we think of someone who says, On Tuesday, you will be at the light at the corner of... That's what we typically think of prophecy. Telling the future. Luke never meant prophecy to mean that when he talks about it in his two books. For Luke's writings, to prophesy is to speak about the present. To be engaged in the present and where God is in the present. To speak in God's name on behalf of God's work in the world. This powerful, prophetic, spirit-filled manifestation first happened 
in Jesus' life, we get past John and what he wore and what he ate. We get to where Jesus is baptized in water and then it all shifts radically from there, right? He hears the voice. The Spirit comes in another gospel, says it lights on him like a dove. Then in one of the gospels, he's taken immediately, he's not even dry yet, and he's taken immediately from the water at the Jordan and the Spirit took him into the wilderness. It was the Spirit that anointed Jesus with the mission to preach good news to the poor and the liberation to the captives. In Jesus' ministry, he's telling his disciples that the Spirit would be with them when they were called before rulers and authorities and then they were going to be required to give an account to their faith. They asked him, well, how are we going to do this? We don't know what to do or what to say. Jesus said, don't worry about it. What you're going to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you that at that very hour what you ought to say. I was wondering if we've just underestimated the power that has been given to us at baptism. Thinking that the primary gift is the forgiveness of sins. And not realizing that this forgiveness and cleansing, this reboot, this new start that we get at baptism, is only the first step in embracing our Christian faith. The second all-important step in this sacrament is living into the awareness of the Holy Spirit. I learned yesterday, 70% of all the venture capital in the world is being given here in this valley. 70% of the planet's venture capital is right here in our neighborhood. This valley is affecting the planet's future in virtually every possible way. The ideas of the world gathering here in this valley. And each of you have a role to play in the action of the Holy Spirit in your life in a place that will affect the planet, not just here. With the gift of the Holy Spirit at baptism, this gift of prophecy, of speaking in the present, calls us to proclaim what God is doing, even now in our world, in our lives, and to do it with boldness. To live into God's good news and to trust that with God, nothing, nothing is impossible. The Spirit is a powerful wind that wants to breathe into our speaking and our acting to accomplish more than we could ever ask or imagine, even to the point of transforming the world as the Spirit did through the first disciples. We here in this valley, in this neighborhood, have been given that task for the future of this planet and our children's children. The stakes are that big and we're right here. It is the breath of the Holy Spirit that sends us out into the world and gives us feet of faith. It is the spirit that creates disciples of doing and disciples of daring. This simple action that begins with water, it makes it real. The water pours over us as we start fresh and start new. Defines for us an action and symbol of deep spiritual change that we have now resident in us. But the baptism also encourages us, whether you are 5 or 33 or 93, to recognize that God has called us. God is leading us and God will guide us toward the gift of our life's mission, our meaning and our purpose. As this year of our Lord 2015 begins, as you live into the power and the prophecy of your baptism, the water and the wind, may you recognize and respond. To the love that God has for you and has always had for you since before you were born. And that in that love may you find healing and hope. And may you live a proverbial prophecy of life. Embodying this life changing experience your baptism. Embracing its truth and the power of the spirit as you reach out as the hands 
and illuminate the face of Jesus in your world. 